Hello, my name is Bob Beatty. I am employed by the University of California in the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources as what they call a farm advisor. Um, <clears throat> farm advisors are located throughout the counties in California and our job is to perform uh, current research projects to create new knowledge to also extend this new knowledge and current knowledge through extensive education programs offered to our clientele and our clientele specifically are <clears throat> farmers and allied industry people and other agriculturalists. The subject that we have to visit uh, today about is the concept of IPM, which is an acronym for Integrated Pest Management. IPM is simply that. It is an integration of a large number of components of an agricultural system, each one of them being taken in con into consideration in making a decision on how a specific problem is going to be corrected. Some people think of integrated pest management as being a very, in a very simplistic terms, and, and the society would like to think that integrated pest management is almost relegated to uh, going out and controlling problems with two blocks of wood. But in reality, the challenges that we have in agriculture and the demands that we have in feeding the world are so great that, that simplicity is no longer the feature of today's agriculture as it may have been back two generations ago when most of the people that I'm speaking to now were in fact living on a farm and had their own integrated system. Today's system is far, far more complex than that and the challenges that we face in maintaining the highest quality food and fiber production in the world in California demands that we approach each problem with a degree of uh, science combined with art and then combined with execution. Let's talk a little bit about this combination of science, art, and execution. And re let's also reflect back on the two blocks of wood that I spoke about and my perception that most of the urbanites in California would really prefer that agriculturalists not spray anything in order to execute the process of producing this superior food and fiber that we're known for in the San Joaquin Valley. But the honest truth is that that's not possible. And the reason for that has to do with the complexities and the pressures that are brought upon agriculturalists in order to not only sustain themselves in an agricultural system in terms of producing uh, a crop that they get paid for, but also to produce enough food and fiber in order to feed the world. And many of the urbanites don't fully appreciate just how critical the San Joaquin Valley is as a production area within the world. It is, in fact, one of the few remaining niles of, of of earth and we can grow anything from apples to zucchini in the San Joaquin Valley, a rarity in other regions of the world. And we do so in a manner that is extremely controlled and regulated for the purposes of guaranteeing the public that we do in fact have safe food. Back in the 1960s when the, when walnuts were rapidly expanding in the southern San Joaquin Valley, uh, we had a pest that is common to all of you in your backyard called aphids. And there is a specific aphid that attacks walnuts. It's known as the walnut aphid. 
And the walnut aphid will build up on both the leaves and the nuts themselves as they're growing during the season. And, the, and, and as the aphid feeds, it extracts uh, juices or sugars from the leaf surface. And, these, and they extract it in such quantities that they then excrete a large percentage of this in their feeding process. And this sh sugary substance then um, develops on the, on the leaves and the nuts and creates the substrate which allows the development of molds. As the molds then develop on the leaves, they reduce the photosynthesis or the food making process of the leaf and they reduce the quality, not only the quality of the walnut, but also the, um, the production of the crop. So the solution initially was to select materials that were available at the time and to go spray the walnut aphid. And that included such things as malathion and uh, <clears throat> products that have now long since been eliminated from our uh, our agricultural system, many of the chlorinated hydrocarbons, such as parathion, have all now long gone. And <clears throat> UC scientists from Berkeley then uh, came down and saw this problem, and then they traveled the world to other walnut growing regions, such as Persia, and looked for a insect that would feed on this particular walnut aphid. Not all aphids, just the walnut aphid. And they in fact found one of these little uh, insects, and it was a little wasp whose scientific name is Trioxy pallidus, also referred in the farmer's terms as the walnut aphid parasite. And they brought this back and they didn't just come down to the valley and toss it out. Instead, it had to go through a very strict quarantine system located up in the Bay Area next to Berkeley, the Albany uh, Research Station. And they then learned how to produce these parasites in fairly large quantities. And once they had assured themselves that the parasite was safe to release into the environment and that it was not going to attack something else that was going to upset the ecological apple cart. The scientists brought this back and with the cooperation of farmers, the far several farmers in the San Joaquin Valley actually planted alfalfa, which is not common, in, in their walnuts in order to have the scientists relief, release this parasite into the alfalfa and it would serve as an alternative food source for the parasite. And within six months they found that this parasite was distributed throughout the entire San Joaquin Valley. They even found it out along the west side of the San Joaquin around I-5 where we also have another UC research station. This pest this parasite to this day, 40 years later, continues to be one of the key components to controlling walnut aphids <clears throat> as a serious pest of this valuable commodity. There are many examples of these uh, great biological control achievements. They include the Vidalia ladybird beetle, which preys upon cottony cushion scale in the citrus industry and helps minimize the necessity for spraying citrus. There are actually viruses that we have specific only to certain insects, such as granulosis virus, which are, can be released onto grapevines for the control of worm insects to minimize the use of pesticides. However, 
these, bi these wonderful biological control examples that I've given you are not um, of sufficient number to cover all of the pests that we deal with in the San Joaquin Valley. So there is a requirement in order again to produce the food and fiber that is uh, known for the San Joaquin Valley and incidentally there's recent research that suggests that this food and fiber production is going to have to double in a period of perhaps as, as little as 40 years that we're going to have to double the production of food in the San Joaquin Valley and so production is going to have to be even more efficient. So in the use of, in, in terms of this efficiency, uh, it becomes necessary to use uh, pesticides, uh, to use them wisely, and to also work with allied industry to develop what we call soft pesticides, which have uh, specific toxicity to insects, but do not have long-term residuals, such as the old products that I talked to you about, such as the chlorinated hydrocarbons. We have new products now that break down very rapidly, and so they have, they're applied with uh, specificity uh, to a given target, um, and uh, have very low impact on the environment. I'll be the first to admit to you that, that Managing this system that I'm speaking to you about is a very complex one. It's not easy, and we don't have all of the answers. You have read about diazinon in the, in the Sierra Nevadas, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and as well as uh, certain birds over, over my career where we had lost, uh, for example, uh, there was a product called azadrin, that was used in the production of cotton fiber that was very hard on, on birds. And when this was discovered, these products were eliminated from the system. And it's exciting to me to be part of this, uh, not speaking simply as an, of, as an advocate of agriculture, but as a member of California society. It's exciting to me to see what changes through science and through the minds of man that we've been able to accomplish because with the elimination of azadrin and the use of different products there has now been a huge resurgence in the, in the hawk population that now uh, exists in California and uh, I've noticed that wherever I drive around the San Joaquin Valley is uh, the number of hawks that are, that are now frequenting uh, habitats.